<laughs> All right, everybody, listen up. We got our medical director in here today, so he's going to talk about tax med and stuff. He brought some uh, some goodies for visual aid, and stuff, so it's pretty interesting. So everybody just pay attention. So if you don't pay attention, you can get in trouble. Right. <laughs> Job security for us, right? Absolutely. All right. Um, well, thank you for having me. I, I think most people know who I am, and I work over at Mercy. I've been at Mercy for 13, going on 14 years. I'm actually a native Dubuqueer, so um, I asked Marvin if he wanted me to just kind of go in my biography. Maybe I'll give you some information about my background. So I grew up in Dubuque. I actually went to Hempstead, just down the road here. Uh, I went to Loris. I was at Loris for three years. University of Iowa for medical school, and I went to Michigan to do my medical, my emergency medicine residency. So I was there for four years, and it was during that time that we got into uh, kind of the tactical emergency medicine side of things and fire and EMS. And I had some pretty strong mentors who, you know, a lot of fire guys, a lot of EMS guys, and they have an interesting system in Kalamazoo where they have public safety officers. So they have EMS, fire, the police all kind of wrapped up into one unit. So these guys will get sort of sent off here to do fire for a month and they come back from their police office for a month and they go off and they ride the ambulance for a month. And they also had their own independent uh, system, I think it was called LIFE, if I remember correctly, they had a LIFE ambulance group there too. So I got a chance to do ride along. So prior to that, I was not really into emergency medicine all that much. I kind of did it because I despised everything else in medicine, but it was really during that time that I got into emergency medicine, pre-hospital medicine, uh, did some stuff in uh, Northern Michigan in Alpena, which is a force <coughs> base. So we taught a uh, tactical medicine course there and I got more into ballistics. We worked with the, it was the Michigan State Police and their tech team, we did some stuff with them. And I came back and I attended a course called CONTOMS, which is counter narcotics, terrorism, uh, operational medicine. So I, I think that's still in, in play, but there's a lot of other programs now that are probably even better than that that have taken over. That was all federal government stuff. There's so many stipulations when you work with the federal government that you think your experience probably isn't as great as it could be. So that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. I never really picked up a gun until residency, honestly, and you know, then I got into hunting and all these other things. So that's where my interest in ballistics comes from. Uh, the lecture today is going to be on ballistics. We're going to probably focus mostly on just the ballistics. If we have time, we can talk a little bit about the tactical emergency medicine side of things. I was the medical director for the tag team for several years. Now there's a guy from the University of Iowa, a guy that I kind of groomed, his name's Dan Wing. I don't know if anybody's ever run into him. He's at Mercy. He does, he does a lot of expeditionary medicine, so he's going off and doing other things, but he's kind of taken over. I got too busy with kids and life and whatnot. So I shoot rarely anymore. I used to shoot a lot more. But I brought my Glock and I brought my AR and I brought my body armor from my tech medicine days. So if anybody wants to look at that. And I also brought some bullets. So I don't know how many people are in neophyte. Gun, gun folks or how many people have guns or if people understand guns or I don't know if you own a gun maybe just raise your hand. Okay, so that's about <laughs> well, <that's> not, <laughs> not quite half. So there's a lot of people here that would maybe this will be an introductory thing for them for guns. And I, I think especially as Dubuque becomes more of a violent place, I was talking to Dr. Brown last evening, we talked about the police and what the police are saying about the summer as the summer approaches and heats up and some of the transients that were formerly transients are now becoming people who are going to stay in the community and we have gang activity. So there's shots fired intermittently, but it used to be you wouldn't find the people or, you know, maybe there's a bullet somewhere, but we didn't find it. Now you're finding more activity. And so as the weather gets warmer, I fully expect to see more gun violence. So I think it's important for everybody in the U.S. to have a good handle on firearms, you know, where the business end of a gun is, that sort of thing. So that's the intention, and that's one, I would say, fork of, of my, my talk, and the other thing is to just be uh, familiar with penetrating trauma, because you don't really see it until you start to see it, and I don't think penetrating trauma is a hard thing, I think it's pretty straightforward, I think it's straightforward for me, it's mostly airway, stabilization, and then off to the arm, for people that run the bowel, or be transferred down to I was if they were shot in the head, whatever it happens to be, but we'll delve into all those things. The first part of the talk is really the sort of the physics, kinetics of, of guns and bullets, and then the second part of the talk, we go into different organ systems and what happens if you get shot in the heart and shot in the head, that sort of thing. And please stop me along the way if you have any questions, because I don't want to make this me soliloquizing for two hours. So please get a hold of me, just raise your hand or just whatever, and then we'll uh, talk about whatever you want to talk about, okay? So um, most of the trauma we take care of in Dubuque County would the vast majority is going to be blunt trauma, it's going to be motor vehicle stuff and people falling down. I'd say probably old people falling down and hitting their heads is what I take care of, and you know that, from the nursing home or from home. 
But I think the more interesting uh, trauma is the penetrating trauma. So we talk about blunt penetrating and we talk about sharp penetrating. Blunt penetrating is essentially I was in my car, I ran into a wall, and the dashboard came out at me and I got poked with glass, whatever it happens to be, or something hit me hard, like the steering wheel, and it actually penetrated into my skin. So that's like a blunt penetrating. That's kind of self-evident. The penetrating trauma is the more interesting trauma. This is the trauma where I was stabbed, I was shot, someone came after me with a pickaxe, whatever it happens to be. And I include this, these idea, this idea of a hybrid weapon. It's important in the medical literature to hear about a hybrid weapon, so that would be like a pickaxe, an awl, whatever that happens to be. So it has elements of both, I would say, a blunt penetrating weapon, but also a sharp penetrating weapon, okay? So, uh, penetrating trauma is, is a significant cause of morbidity and mortality. Uh, a lot of people get shot with guns. The thing to remember about gunshots, especially in the United States, uh, most people are shot with handguns, and I'll elucidate on this further. And just because you were shot doesn't mean you, get, you die. And the most, it's, it's a funny thing in Dubuque. Most of the people that I've seen, whether it's Eddie Chess or whoever, these guys that are shot multiple times even, with handguns, they don't often die. Usually, I, I don't see that all the time. I see the people I see get killed with handguns are the ones who are execution-style murdered, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, those places where they were shot at close range and somebody had all the time in the world to aim and to hit them in a nice, important spot. But if it's just a quote-unquote gun battle, a lot of these times with handguns, now, A, people have horrible aim. They don't practice at the range. They shoot like this. You hear a lot of that. <laughs> so they don't use their front sight. Yeah, Television those types of issues. And, uh, and, and they don't often hit people multiple times in important places. And so that's why I include this slide. <laughs> so, um, guns don't kill people, I do, you've heard that before. Okay, so this is the guy, he likes guitars and he likes guns and he likes, he has a knife. Yeah, like like kind of. <laughs> anyway, so, so that's the idea and we'll expound on some of those other issues as we go through, but basically ballistics, we're just studying projectiles and that's, a, that's an easy way to think about ballistics. We're studying stuff being tossed, so throwing a baseball is essentially ballistics, you know, you're, you're lobbing something and we're talking about adding orders of magnitude more, energy behind those things when we talk about guns, shooting straighter, faster. Uh, and it's an important for us to talk about what is we quote unquote high velocity, what's low velocity, so if you have a handle on that. And this is really uh, something that we want to talk about in the literature because most guys that even write about this stuff are not gun guys, they're not going off to the range. They're trauma guys who probably eschew guns, probably don't even like guns. They think guns are a huge public health issue and they think that guns should all be taken away. And the vast majority of people, especially who write these papers, are left wing radicals. Who hate, who hate guns, and so when they do talk about it, it's with kind of a, I would say, a sneering sort of insincere idea of, well, we're going to have another Sandy Hook, Columbine, or whatever, if we, you know, allow guns to be in people's hands. And so you read the literature and you'll see there's this undertone of disdain for gun owners, for, for the idea of people having guns. So but, uh, that's an aside. So 2,000 feet per second is considered high velocity. You know, if you go less than 2,000, then you're thinking it's going to be a low-velocity weapon. If you're in Britain, they like the, you know, the Brit, the, the smaller, smaller handguns, I and mean, you can barely get a gun there. If you're in Ireland, you have to go to the police station and ask them for your 22 caliber. They count off the amount of ammunition you have when you leave. You bring back. You have to hand in your handgun. I mean, it's a big mess. So all the British Isles, lots of places in the world, there's massive amounts of gun control. So that everything over there, what we would consider... Uh, high velocity or even like a low velocity weapon is what they would consider high velocity. So we're talking about 1100 feet per second is what they consider high velocity. And that comes out of the, the, the literature in the Lancet. That's their British Medical Journal. And so that's the difference. We like, people in America like big cars, big roads, and big guns. You know, like 375 H&H Magnum, which I brought up before. I didn't bring the gun itself, but stuff like that. The Magnums are something that, that's, a, that's an American thing, whereas if you go to Australian hunt, you go even on the uh, other places in Europe, you know, they'll hunt with a small, a lot smaller gun, what we would consider to be kind of a mid-range gun, like a 7.62 by 5.4, kind of a dragon off round, they consider that to be a big gun, they say we don't need all these magnum loads, but that's kind of an American thing, again, an aside, but <laughs> I tend to do that when we talk about guns because things will pop into my head as I discuss guns, too. you know, we like guns, anyway. Um, again, I said you know, over 2,000 feet per second, and so that's the cutoff, but then we talk about 2,500 to like 3,000 feet per second. 30 out 6, 7 million magnum, those types of guns. Those are fast, flat shooters that mess people up when they hit them. Mess caribou up, mess whatever is on the other end of it. Uh, and just, just 
to, you couldn't have a ballistic lecture without talking about kinetic energy. And so essentially, the kinetic energy is the mass times the velocity squared. So the size of the bullet, and then how fast is the bullet going? Okay, any questions so far? That is pretty straightforward. I include this just to give you an idea of the inner workings on what the bullet's all about. And then the two, these are basically the three sh uh, flavors of bullets that you'll encounter. So you have a rim fire, which is off to the far right. So that would be like your 22, um, the 1022, the Ruger 1022. I think they sell, they, they, they sell uh, the Ruger still has like one of their top sellers. They sell lots and lots of 22. For a while, you couldn't even find 22 ammo because there's a run on it. It's considered to kind of be the survival round. People like the 22. But the idea, the difference between a striker or say a primer fire casing, center fire casing, and, a, and, and this would be the fact that you need the primer here to be struck by your firing pin or striker. Whereas over here, if the pin hits anywhere in the base here, that causes explosion. This is the powder, the powder explodes, and then this is the business end of the bullet. The bullet flies out of the gun. There's rifling, there's twisting in the gun and the barrel, and so that's what propels it forward. Now this, these are both very similar. This would be a low velocity round, this would be a high velocity round. Then we're talking about a shotgun a lot. And I think most people in Iowa, this would be probably what they're most familiar with because we don't do a lot of long range shooting. All our deer are taken with slug guns. So same idea, here's your primer, there's your primer. So they're parallels and then you have the powder and then this is your wad. Then the wad is exploded upon, it's acted upon by the powder charge. This shoots forward, a shotgun is different from these because you have multiple little balls. Uh, so it can be double out buck, it can be uh, you know eight shot, whatever you, you're shooting. And that's what's propelled outside the gun and then that's what goes and does the damage. So I will pass these around. This is a slug. This is a hundred day slug. This is what I shoot deer with. And this is a tactical load, it's a double out buck. Double out buck is one of those very seasoned, very respected loads The people in the, in the military the AA-12, if you guys are familiar with the AA-12, the block block is like this, the standby shotgun look for that. So I'll pass that around as well. But this, the idea is this would open up and it would expand and it would just spread shot everywhere. And that's what you hunt birds with. You can hunt deer in some places. They say you can shoot with the block block. I'm not sure if that's a great idea, but some people do it. Coyotes with a turkey choke, you can shoot those with the block block too. The guys in Bellevue that hunt with dogs with sometimes have a guy with an AR and another guy with a shotgun for close work. So, and that's just a, to kind of reiterate, this is the basic idea behind the bullet. I'll pass one of these around. I'll just pass the whole thing around. These are, all of these are all standard fire. I'll go through, I might as well, I'll pass them around, you have plenty of time to look at them. So, this is a dragging off round, that's former Soviet round. This is the longest serving round. Like in the, in the world, basically, like the 1890s when they developed this round, it's a bow tail round, but it's been around forever. And they still shoot it out dragging off rifles. This is my 223. Okay, this is what goes into the AR. This is 7.62 by 39. Again, this is another one of those. This is your AK 47 round, which I left at home. I didn't bring that. With me. And then we get into the handguns, and uh, we'll get into those and talk about those some more. This is my 45. I have a section on 45. We can talk about that. You can feel the weight. You can compare the size of the bullets. And this is my 40. This is what goes into the Glock. So I didn't bring my 1911, but this is the 40. This is, this is, a, this is just a target round. This is not a full metal jacket. I didn't, I didn't uh, bring one of those. But uh, 40 is really probably one of the more popular police rounds. The vast, vast, vast majority of police services will use the 40. Smith & Wesson, which is... It's a, it was a 10 millimeter and they knocked it down into a 40 because it was too big and people couldn't get their hands around it. That This basically came due to, to problems after that Miami shootout. They weren't probably armed sufficiently. The FBI said we need a bigger round. So they talked to all the gun manufacturers. They came up with a 40 after um, that. They wanted more stopping power. So the ballistics on both of these are pretty good. And we'll talk about this as well, the 45 versus the 40. If you look at the gelatin studies, um, I won't steal my thunder for later. Look at those. <laughs> and then this is an elephant gun. This is a 375 H&H &H Magnum. This kicks. So if you want to go to Africa, this would be the minimum caliber you'd use for dangerous game. Okay. And it just goes up from there, like you know, 470 nitros, the stuff that dislocates your retina. You know, if you shoot it too much. Okay. So you can pass those around. <laughs> these are just the extractor. If you, if you look at the bullet, these are. 
I included just to give you an idea of the myriad different types of extractors that are on the bottom of it. Again, the primer sticks right there. It depends on your gun and how it interacts with the bottom of the bullet, whether it's going to be a, uh, a semi-auto uh, system or if you have to work the bolt. You know, if it's, it's one of those types of, of guns. But uh, let's put this in to say, the different types of tips on the bullet. You'll see there's a variety of different types of tips. Some of them are made to be more high penetrating. Some of them are a softer nose, kind of this blunted nose to dump more energy into an animal or a person, whatever you're shooting. Uh, again, just for computer's sake. We talked about lands and grooves inside the gun. And uh, I think afterwards I can show you inside, especially the AR, if you break it down, you can look at the lands and grooves. But in through here, these are lands, these are grooves, and it's this twisting that allows the bullet to be propelled further, faster, straighter, and gives you more accuracy. And that was an innovation, well, you know, just post, let's say, Revolutionary War, everything was muzzle loaders. And uh, after that, they developed these lands and grooves, and then you had the Kentucky Long Rifle, and that's when the bullets were shot straighter, faster, quicker, and more accurately. Is that what gives the ballistics that they use? Exactly. And so it's lands and grooves, and it's kind of like a fingerprint almost. Each gun has its own fingerprint. And so if you guys that know what they're doing will grab up their casings, and they'll, that's why revolvers in some situations, if people are going to shoot each other, they like the revolver because the casings are maintained. And then they can destroy the gun or hide the gun. Um, but they can certainly line up the lands and grooves on the bullet if they find it, if they can find the weapon. And that's, that's more of a forensic thing. That's a different lecture, sort of in and of itself. But that's the idea. That's where the... The uh, sort of the signature of each weapon comes from. Again, just not to belabor it, this is one of my last slides here, but it talks about the powder, the wad, the primer, all those things. And you see an example of that. One's a, one's a slug and the other one's a shot. All right. Uh, shotguns are an interesting situation. Again, most people are familiar with shotguns, I think, more in Iowa than anywhere else. But the shotgun, if it's close to you, it's high velocity. The further you get away, it's low velocity. And we've had shootings here, police involved shootings. If a guy's far away and he gets shot with, he gets shot at, I should say, he'll probably live. I'd rather be shot with a shotgun far away if it's shot than close up. The damage is minimal. But if you're within, let's say, the space of this room, that can be devastating and you, you might die from that, just given the amount of trauma. Then the shot comes out and the shot expands, expands, expands. Has anyone ever had it in their shotgun? You know what I, mean? I say what I mean? What I mean when I say that, that means you want to see what kind of pattern you'll get. And so you go out, 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 out. So for our purposes as EMS providers, we want to know was it a close range shot, gun blast, or was it far away? If it's close range, you can think about ice cream scoops of stuff being taken away. If you're far away, say out in the parking lot, and you're you don't have any eye involvement, you might survive with a few pellets that need to be dug out. We've had a couple of cases like that. The Eddie Chess thing, you remember that? That was yep. shot at, at the police officer. And they hit him, but it was minimal stuff. Whereas he shot him with his service weapon, it was a 40, and he had one in his spine and one in his back. Again, any chest lift, he didn't have any major long term sequelae. So, again, you can get shot multiple times, it doesn't mean you're going to die. So, this is a shotgun, it's a hobo with a shotgun. That was a bad movie that came out several years ago. Does anybody know who that actor is? Have you ever seen the movie Blade Runner? Rutger Hauer. So oh, wow. Before he was unceremoniously dismissed from the upper ranks of Hollywood. So anyway, that's the wad. The wad can actually be a projectile. If you've ever shot the wad, you know, the wad flies out. So typically, if the wad is embedded in the patient or the, the, the person who's been shot, the victim, <coughs> then you'll know that it's pretty close range. Right. If the wad is not inside, then it doesn't mean it wasn't close range. But if you find a wad in somebody, that means someone was really mad at you. <laughs> so kinetic energy, we talked about this. I wanted to belabor the math uh, about what that means. And so now we're going to talk about what it means to have downstream effect from the bullet or what happens when the bullet hits you. So we can talk about how fast the bullet is. We talked about velocities. Now let's talk about foot pounds. And, and essentially, the, this, is, this is what a lot of ballisticians, if, if you read American Rifleman, they'll talk about this, how many foot pounds are put down there. You wonder how many foot pounds. So, when the bullet impacts, how much energy is dumped into the target? And so a lot of people, this is kind of like their crack. If you're a ballistician or you work for you know, Smith & Wesson or you work for Hornaday or whoever, and you want to talk about, well, what does the gun do to the bullet and how much energy is transferred into the target at the end of it all? So 
Uh, specific, specific to this issue, bullets can be deformed, they can, they can undergo fragmentation, uh, all these things like mass, whether it flies straight or if it tumbles and does yaw, all those things are important in terms of what the bullet will do when it hits the target. And you don't know right away what's going to happen when the bullet hits. And sometimes the 22 can be devastating or sometimes the 22 just rattles around. I had a kid who shot somebody out of Casey's in Asbury. The guy came in, the bullet went in here, came up the neck, didn't touch any of the great vessels, spun around his head and came out the side. It came out the side or it lodged up here or it was partially lodged up here. So, I mean, bullets act really weird. The AK-47 is one of those that people talk about. I mean, I've never shot anybody. I'm not a tactical guy. I have no police experience other than what I've done here. I've never, I've never done anything like that. I'm not a military person. So, uh, but the, the anecdotal reports are, you know, we shot him in the leg and it ended up in his chest up here. So they just, they, they tend to be very unstable when they fly. So that can be good if you're trying to clear a room and kill everybody. It's not so good if you're trying to make a 300 yard shot. Does that make sense? So every, every job is like, a, you know, when you're building a house, every tool has its own purpose and bullets and, and guns are no different. We will talk about the wound channel, the temporary cavity, the primary cavity, vacuum, yaw, and tumble. It's just something to be aware of so you're familiar with these terms. So these are gelatin studies, and up here you can see a nine millimeter. I'm not a big nine guy, so I didn't bring nine with me, okay? But the military adopted nine a long time ago. That's the NATO round, and so that's why you see a lot of nine. Uh, and the JHP means jacketed hollow point, okay? So you see at the end of here when they've shot, that they turn into these little stars of the stellate configuration, and that's because all the energy has been dumped into the gelatin. And that's the idea. It goes so far, then it starts to fall apart. It doesn't zip through something, it actually kind of dumps its energy. So the, what, what most people will look at is how wide is that? How much damage did I do to the tissue when it hits? So you can see the nine millimeter, that's 124 grain. That's the size of the, of the business end. This is 147 grain. Now we move to 357 SIG, which is what the Secret Service used. Whether they still use it, I'm not sure. That's a funny looking bullet. It has, supposedly has even some body armor penetration ability. That's what was said at one time. I've never shot 357 SIG. I don't, that's not my, my round. 40 Smith and Wesson, 165, and this is what the cops will carry in jacket at hollow point. And then the 180 and the 40. And then down here, it cuts off a little bit, but you see the 45. And I passed around a 40 and 45. And what you want to do is you want to compare the two. You say, well, these aren't all that different. This is a little bit zippier because the feet per second. Down here, it's a little bit slower. But then if you're looking at what it does to the gelatin, that's, that's what people look at when they want to know, well, what's this going to do to the animal or person when I shoot them, okay? The permanent cavity is kind of the track. If you remember, Abraham Lincoln was shot, and they were putting sticks and sounds into his head, and they tracked the bullet, and they probably ended up hurting him more than anything. That's the word on the street anyway. That they probably killed Lincoln because he was mishandled, ultimately, because he was shot them one time. Close range, but with a not a very effective um, gun. And so that's the track that you see all the time, and you could actually pass your finger through that track in one end and out the other. So that's a permanent cavity, and that's pretty self-evident, right? I told you about the 10 millimeter. That just looks like a nuclear weapon right there went off, right? The 10 millimeter you can hunt stuff with, and this is what the 40 was based off of. So Smith and Wesson came out with the 10, and then they, the FBI said, oh, that's too much, you know, that's too much cowbell. We want to, you know, so. They went to 40, but that's what that's what the 10 millimeter did. So that's, man, that's a pretty impressive round, but their female agents couldn't get their hands around the gun, and that was the problem. So when we talk about wound channel, this is just a cartoon. Again, you see these are cartoons based off of the gelatin studies, and these these are you know like your 303. That's your British round. You still see people hunt with that. 7.62 by 5.1. That's going to be like your 308. And then the 7.62 by 5.1, 308, 7.62 by 5.1. Those are all your 308s, but that's the military designation. Okay. And then this is, uh, we talk about Warsaw Pact, which is kind of dissolved now since communism has fallen, but we talk about Eastern countries. Uh, 7.62 by 3.9 is your AK-47 round, and I pass that around, and you can also see the 5.4. And you can see some of the tumble and the yaw, you know, the, the 7.62 by 3.9, look at this. It's all over the place, and it has weird kinetics in through here, and it ends up over there, and it's zipping up through there. So that's why the AK has gotten probably a deserved reputation for being kind of a tumble in the yard. I include this in here. This is just a, a break. We'll do a couple of these, but these are all different different um, words. Anyone, if you read those words, when you look at them, can you tell what they're in reference to? For Westerners, this might be the one that you can maybe maybe clue in on. I don't know if you There you go. Very good. You're the first one to. When I've, when I've told people this in the past, yeah. So, yep. Mixed 
I'm curious. You got any pants on? Someone broke his penis off there. That's second night. What's that? Um, yeah, good. It's all God's work. I include that because I think violence is one of those things that's cross-generational, it's cross-national. I don't think there's anybody that's not. I mean, everybody, we have a long-standing history of people wanting to hurt each other. So I think the, that's reflected in people's mythology, and you see that across the entire world. So even these supposedly most polite cultures in the world, like Japan, that are all Shinto monks now, I mean, they used to be quite violent back when they were imperialistic. They still have a god of war. Everybody has a god of war. And so people have been hurting each other for a long time. All right, um, and I mentioned that one of those was a was a uh, specific nationality. Do you know who invented gunpowder? <coughs> Supposedly invented gunpowder. Chinese. Chinese. This is I took this out of a book <coughs> called Ammo Land. It's online, but I mean, of course, they're all communists now. So the political commentary is, you know, it's real hard to own a gun in China. It's real hard to own a gun anywhere in these places. I mean, gun ownership actually is the exception rather than the rule, if you think about where the world is, as a so, you know, where socialism is taken over. So uh, there's a lot of guns being burned up. The United States, of all the Commonwealth countries, the English-speaking world, your, your right to carry, you know, to bear a firearm is, is, uh, is orders of magnitude greater in terms of your leeway, your freedom, than, than in New Zealand, where, where they will not allow handguns. There's a lot of hunting in New Zealand, there's a lot of long guns. Uh, in South uh, Africa, you can have a long gun. They really do not like handguns. If you go to England, forget about it. Anywhere in the British Isles, Isle of Man. If you're in Northern, if you're in Ireland, which in the Republic of Ireland, which isn't, uh, isn't technically the British Isles, in Northern Ireland, forget about it. It's hard, hard, hard to have a gun. So I couldn't walk in here with a Glock and AR-15. I mean, this is a it's a pretty outstanding thing you think about the way the rest of the world is structured, that I can walk around with my concealed carry permit and just plop down you know, a weapon of mass destruction according to some magazines and talk about this stuff. So I, I think it's important that everybody just be aware of that. The more I travel, the more I find that this is kind of a disgusting planet with a lot of disgusting people in charge of it. And uh, you know, if you don't have a gun, you should probably go buy one, even if it just sits there. Maybe get trained up with it, but it's, it's your right as an American. It's in a, u a very unique right. All right, so my NRA talk is that portion. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see here. Am I going the right way? Yeah. So we talked about the permanent cavity, and again, there's this other the other thing called the temporary <coughs> cavity. And if you go back to where we were before, I showed you some pictures. Well, way back here, but this would be the permanent cavity. This is the temporary cavity, and I think the science is one of those things where they say. We're not sure what this is, it's more people postulate that this is a temporary cavity. And, and what happens ultimately is, I'm not going the right way, sorry. We think this is what happens, the bullet hits, it expands out. When it expands out, it causes all kinds of hydrostatic shock, and you'll hear that term once in a while. And then that's what causes a lot of injury to people as it pushes out and then and it kind of affects those organs and disrupts blood flow and causes tissue fragmentation, those sorts of things. And so, uh, this is a gelatin, it's basically a block. And this is made to approximate human muscle tissue. Because if, and we'll discuss this more in, later in the second half as well. But the idea is a human muscle tissue is a, a good um, middle road between your skin, which is soft and very elastic, and say like your lungs, and your bone, which is quite hard, right? And so human muscle tissue is the, kind of the middle road. And you cover a lot of muscle. When people are getting shot, typically they're being shot, whether they're shot in the chest, leg, whatever it happens to be. But they said this is kind of a middle of the road medium that we can shoot and get a good idea. So it approximates what it's like for people to be shot. And then we can tell how much penetration is going to happen and, and how much uh, injury will potentially happen to that person, right? So you see there the wound channel. This is the temporary cavity, and again, it's more of one of these things you think, well, I think this is what's happening, and then over here you have your, your permanent wound channel, and then the fragmentation. And that's what a jack in a hollow point looks like after it's hit. You saw it in all those other studies, the, the gelatin studies I did, you see how it's designed to, to, to almost to turn into sort of a, uh, it's like a drill bit on the end in a way. It has all this stuff hanging out, it looks like you cut your finger, and yeah, I have cut my finger when I dug those out of animals before slice my finger, scratch my finger, so those things will cause problems for people. So you can see why you wouldn't want to be shot with that. When the bullet comes from the factory, if you just take the head off it, you won't see this, but you see how that's 
almost like a 10 degree angulation there. That is from the gun itself. Those are the lands and grooves, and that's what spins the bullet. So when something's spinning, that's better than just being shot out straight. And so that's why the gun's more effective, okay? All right, we're gonna delve off in just for a second. We kind of touched on this, but when I say, if I'm talking to you and we're talking about guns, and I say, what does 47 mean to you?